Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is David G. Myers. I will tell you all about David in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert for others. And when you do it from a leadership standpoint, as you will discover that Dave is, uh, you do it with the purpose of bringing people together. Welcome to Grace Under Pressure, Dave Myers. So, Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I want to tell folks all about you. Um, you are a social psychologist and a communicator, as you call yourself, of psychological science to college students, where you have taught at Hope College for generations, perhaps, and uh, also the general public. Your scientific writings have been in the National Science Foundation, created fellowships. You have been in the American Scientist, American Psychologist, and Psychological Science. You also write for the general public for including places like Scientific America and the Christian Century. And your book, your textbooks are considered seminal in the study of psychology. So, and you're a prize winner and you're an all around good guy. And how do I know you're a good guy? Because we're doing this as a retake because I neglected to uh, uh, record it when we started. So welcome, Dave. So Thank you. Delighted okay. to be here with you again, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So your newest book is um, How Do We Know Ourselves? Curiosities and Marbles of the Human Mind. What led you to write this book? You've written many. So what prompted you, Dave? So uh, A little background, uh, John, and thank you so much for your kind words about the book. Uh, I'm a social psychologist who's done research in my field, social psychology, that has led me into reporting on psychological science through textbooks for introductory psych students and social psych students. And that has mandated my reading the entirety of psychological science and discerning what is humanly significant here? What do educated people need to know? And packaging that in textbooks. But as I do so, I come across material that strikes me as so interesting, so fascinating, so humanly significant, or so helpful that not just college students, but everybody should know about this. And that's what has led me to do some of this other writing you mentioned, including essays the last few years for a blog that is can be accessed at talkpsych.com, talkpsych, one word, dot com. And the essay writing, which was a great pleasure for me, uh, led me to have a conversation with Farrar Strauss, a sister publisher to my text companies, about the possibility of collecting some of these and some other original essays into this new book of essays that's subtitled Curiosities and Marvels of the Human Mind. Well, this uh, How Do We Know Ourselves is a gem. Um, it is a collection of multiple essays, and it's organized in three sections, which are Who Am I? Who Are We? And what in the world? What led you to this kind of grouping, Dave? So, so rather than just have 40 essays on 40 diverse topics, my editor thought we should organize them into this, these sections. Who am I? Which focuses on the self. Who are we? Focuses on our relationships with others. And what in the world takes a look at what psycho psychological science has to say about the larger world around us. And thus, that's the organization. And what weaves through all of these are my two kind of overriding aims in all my writings, John. And one is to help people, to help myself, think smarter about our everyday <laughs> lives. And also, secondly, to savor the wonders of our everyday lives. And so I think there's a lot of unappreciated wonders of our human existence that I've been pleased to report on. Well, you know, I think that's part of your gift, Dave, because there is a sense of wonder. You have spent your entire career in uh, psychology, social psychology, yet you write these essays with a spirit of enthusiasm and zest and, yes, when wonder and humor. And that makes it uh, so appealing to a general audience. So it's a gem. Now, let me ask you a question that uh, gets to who am I. Social scientists tell us that um, it's hard for us to know ourselves. Why is that, Dave? So. Yeah, and there's uh, really a mixed picture that the social sciences and psychological science in particular give us. 
Uh, and it's rather like the mixed picture, John, that we find in literature and religion as well. On the one hand, we are the apex of creation, little less than the angels, the psalmist said. <laughs> I mean, meat loaf sized bone can do spectacular things in terms of reading the world around us, understanding our own lives, forming theories about one another, reasoning, seeing the world, sending people to the moon. I mean, you name it. Uh, we have incredible cognitive systems, uh, noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, Shakespeare Hamlet uh, said. And yet, on the other hand, we are prone to error. In so many ways, we don't know ourselves or we mistake our understandings of ourselves and the world around us. We are the hollow men, uh, T.S. Eliot said. <laughs> no one can detect his own errors, the psalmist said. Uh, uh, and so clear us from our hidden faults. And so we're deceived by perceptual illusions, by psychic claims, by false memories, by misinformation, by conspiracy theories. So we do need to think smarter, even as we savor the wonders of our lives. Right. As you were saying that, some, I want, oh, something came to mind because I've explored this topic of self-awareness and, and leaders, and they too suffer from the same phenomenon. Do you think it's maybe a form of self-protection? I'm, um, you know, we don't really want to know the truth about ourselves, or what do you think, Dave? So, um, Certainly, we are strongly motivated to have a good opinion of ourselves, and so, uh, it helps to be confident in our own knowledge in order to assert ourselves in the world and to make high achievements. So that's for certain. But uh, there's uh, so many ways that we now in which uh, which we now know in which it's uh, it's so easy to form and sustain false beliefs about ourselves and about the world around us, and that's why rational evidence-based thinking is so important for leadership and certainly for our everyday lives. Without question, which there's a corollary or some related topic, and it's you write about the power and the peril of intuition. So explain the, the dichotomy there. So, so that, that would be a great example of so, ways in which we both succeed and we often fail. So we have great powers to our intuition that is our automatic, uh, uh, Im uh, impulsive, uh, unreasoned, implicit thoughts. They serve us well in many ways. And so just think about how we form words right now, John. How do you form the word bad versus pad? Intuitively know how to do that, but I dare you to explain to somebody else how to form their mouth to form those two words, right. or you develop expertise uh, with experience. Uh, an athlete, uh, a point guard on a basketball team has a kind of intuitive knowledge of what to do flowing down the floor and how to distribute the ball. A chess master can look at the board and kind of intuitively know what the, what the next step is. Uh, a, a, an experienced diagnostician, like your father, a physician, might walk into a room and have an, a, a sense of what the patient's problem is. And we also have examples of our powers of intuition from, uh, for example, people who have blind sight, who consciously cannot see anything, and yet there's a, another track to their information processing that allows them to steer clear of an object in the hallway that they need to walk around. Right. And we have intuitive skill at, when it comes to reading emotions and very thin slices of observing somebody sure. leading or teaching, we can get a sense of their enthusiasm, their personality, and it's really quite a valid sense, that quick, spontaneous judgment. Right. That's, that, that's the power of our intuition. And the peril, because it's... But, is a... Absolutely. The perils are just as great. And so, for example, just to pick a few examples, we're not very good lie detectors. <laughs> One demonstration that I've reliably done in my own teaching is to ask 10 students, uh, have them draw a slip out of a, a hat. Half of those slips say, tell a lie, and the other half say, uh, tell the truth. And they're all to, either gonna, they're going to tell a story that's either a lie or the truth. And then the rest of the class, after hearing these 10 stories, has to guess who told the lie and who told the truth. 
and how confident they are in each judgment. Typically, they're 75% confident, but only about 52% correct in terms of trusting their intuition and reading others' lies. Or we intuitively often fear the wrong things. People fear flying more than driving in a car, even though mile per mile, they're more than 500 times safer on a commercial aircraft than they are in an automobile. Uh, in, and when it comes to management and leadership, we have many studies that on what's called the interviewer illusion. People, uh, uh, employers often have a gut trust in their sense of somebody from an informal interview as to how good an employee and how long they last. They may, that's really not a very good predictor of employment, our interviewer yeah. intuition. And likewise, gamblers and psychics and stockbrokers all act on intuition that's often flawed intuition. So uh, what we need to do is, is harness our intuition, but check it. Check it against reality. Check it against evidence. Uh, because uncritical intuition can sometimes lead us into ill-fated decisions and ill-fated relationships. All right. And that leads us right into the next topic of uh, overconfidence. How do we correct it? <laughs> so... Yeah. First of all, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's called the overconfidence phenomenon. And there's lots of uh, cognitive science experiments that, for example, ask people simple questions like, is absinthe a liquor or a precious stone? Uh, in answer to such questions, when people feel 75% confident, they'll tend to be about 60% correct. Or, or if you say, give me a range, uh, such that you're ninety percent, such that you're ninety percent confident, the population of, of Mumbai falls within this range. Well, people give you an estimate they're ninety percent confident about, and they're about forty percent of the time wrong. Uh, it falls outside the range of their estimate. So these and expert forecasters that make forecasts and then give you also an estimate of how confident they are are routinely overconfident in in the judgments they make. The famed Dunning-Kruger uh, effect by my uh, colleague, friend, social psychologist at the University of Michigan, David Dunning, uh, documents that so often people who have a little bit of knowledge tend to overestimate their own knowledge because when you know something but know, don't know a lot, you don't know how much more you don't know. And so it's <laughs> easy for uh, our ignorance to become invisible. And so, that's what leads to the planning fallacy for people to, to overestimate how quickly they're going to complete a project when it takes longer. Uh, that's what leads students to even, even err in their predictions of their own future behavior. If, how confident are you that you're going to complete this course, that you're going to right. not drop out of school, that you're going to stay in the same dorm room? That People are overconfident. Right. Well, is a corollary to that or a check on overconfidence, something that you also write about, and I um, write and teach and coach it, humility. So, but you put a twist on it and call it the science of humility. What did you mean by that, Dave? So, right. So uh, a flourishing life needs a balance between convictions and humility. You need to have something you deeply believe in. You need to be anchored in certain values and you need to have things you really believe are true. But we also need to hold our beliefs lightly with a spirit of humility, recognizing that we might be wrong. And the much studied phenomenon of intellectual humility is really an acknowledgement that our beliefs may contain error. And this is important for civil discourse, the spirit of humility, for effective leadership, uh, for uh, scientific inquiry. And so... Uh, humility isn't necessarily thinking less of oneself. It's not deprecating oneself. It's thinking of oneself less. It's focusing on things beyond self, on right. things larger than self. And yeah. so uh, you show social psychologists a place or a person where humility abounds, where people are focused on others and where they're not uh arrogantly overconfident in their own judgments and where they're open to others. And they'll show you a place where there's uh, accurate self-awareness and human flourishing. And when it comes to work, John, you're a, you're a mentor of, and a coach of leaders. And you've seen, I'm sure, so many occasions, as I've experienced, when better work happens, 
when, well, the pack is greater than the lone wolf. And so I don't put anything out there of my writing without it being critiqued and edited by multiple people. And at the end of the day, all of us are smarter than any one of us alone. And so I know I benefit from approaching, you know, having to, I'm, I'm always just amazed. It's something I've worked to the point, I think it's just perfect, but it's not perfect. <laughs> well, it's never going to be that way, but that's, right. but, but you have the humility to acknowledge, hey, I need an outside perspective. And that's what humility comes in to leadership because the go it alone doesn't work so well <laughs> in organizations. So Exactly. Whereas when you're open and you're inviting feedback and you're inviting other creative input, uh, collectively, again, uh, all of us together are smarter than any one of us alone. And yet we like to talk about all of us together, but you have something and I had not heard this term, the psychology of division. What is that and why? So, so there, John, I was writing a little essay on kind of the curious phenomenon of peoples that are often very much alike to be so sharply divided and antagonistic. So it might be Sunni and Shia really aren't on the world scale of things that much different or Protestants and Catholics and uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, or the, I've lived in the UK quite a bit, the Scots attitude towards the English, yeah. or in my world, uh, Hope and Calvin basketball. I mean, where uh, <laughs> these two schools share a common D Dutch religious heritage, and yet they're, yeah. they're, they're antagonists. And that's yeah. a result of a couple of factors. One is our attention always focuses on how we differ from those around us. Mm -hmm. We can be so much alike in so many ways, but we don't notice, we don't attend to our commonalities. We attend to and focus on how we differ. And, uh, and, and, and we tend to divide people into us and them, in group and out group. We draw a circle that includes us and then defines the other, those that are on the outside. And uh, this has been done in some clever social psychological experiments. And as soon as you draw a circle that defines us, and it could be a, something trivial, uh, the people who like this art rather than that art, you tend to favor your own group and to be biased against the other group. Right. Well, there, isn't there, you know, to, to come back there, isn't there comfort in division? You know, I mean, so we do that in sports rivalries. It's my team, your team. OK. And that's that's all fun and games and stuff. But when we draw into ourselves and, and focus on this difference that make, makes us feel better, does it not? Or and, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, our identity is both personal and social. And so if you're a, a Detroit Lions fan, now that the Detroit <laughs> Lions are doing better, I mean, that's part of your social identity. Or if you're a person of a particular religious group or in a particular occupation, uh, that social identity is an answer to the question, who am I? So it's very important. But what then often happens is we tend to interact mostly with similar others within our tribe. And as others do the same within their tribe, there can occur a phenomenon that is where I cut my eye teeth in social psychology called group polarization. That is each group magnifies its own leanings, which become more extreme and more different from those in the other group. And thus animosities can happen. And I well, never anticipated the extent to which social media, uh, cable television appealing to either right or left would facilitate and empower uh, group polarization. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the buzzword is for what you described is um, echo chamber. You know, um, I'm right. OK. Every, everybody agrees with me. And if you don't agree with me and my friends or my cohort, you're an idiot. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. So great. So um, part of that may, may, maybe is something this implicit bias. Can we. Uh, unlearn it <laughs> or how do we cope with it yeah very good point and i'd say two big conclusions have come from social psychological research on implicit bias uh maybe three uh the first is it's real and it's pervasive uh so we see this in experiments uh 
in which we give people, for example, they might be uh, Uber drivers or Airbnb hosts or police officers. If, if somebody is labeled with a race label, uh, like Lakeisha versus Emily or Jamal versus Greg, it may bias their behavior, their willingness to pick them up or whatever. Sure. And, or, or if you see somebody holding an ambiguous object in the dark, is it a phone or a gun? Your implicit bias may affect how you interpret based on the race of that person. And, and we have lots of experiments that assess people's implicit attitudes, as you likely have heard. So point number one, implicit bias is real. Point number two, can a couple hours of implicit bias training by a well-meaning corporation change all that? And the answer turns out to be disappointingly not so. And so people like Anthony Greenwald and Brian Nosek, who are the pioneering researchers on implicit bias, say that implicit bias training has been shown not to be effective. And sometimes it's even counterproductive. Right. So, 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 so what can we do is your other question. And I think what we can, what we can do is maybe adjust our behavior to structure our interactions uh, mm -hmm. in a way that equalizes power and opportunity for people or that articulates norms as to how we treat all customers. Uh, and so if, if you structure the social situation in a way that is egalitarian, that that is more productive than trying to train knee-jerk implicit bias out of people. Right. Not, that, not that that's of no help, but that's a really difficult proposition. Right. No, and, in, and perhaps uh, we need a little bit of humility about ourselves, or not so much our, our ourselves, but our perceptions of others. You know, that, hey, maybe I'm not as smart or as right or as perceptive as I think I really am. Would you agree right. with that, Dave? So I would totally agree with that. Well, well, while we're on this contentious topic, <laughs> we come to, and you have a chapter on, politicians. How does politics change politicians? Well, it's a very interesting phenomenon that we've seen happen is politicians morph over time from, uh, from opposing something and then espousing it. Uh, so, for example, before 2016, when there were multiple people running for the Republican nomination for president, Many people were uh, uh, had contempt for Donald Trump, who then came to be defending defenders of him and even seemingly devoted to him. And people wondered, is this all insincere? Is this a chameleon like strategy that politicians do? I think not necessarily, because we have so much research that shows us that our attitudes often follow our behavior. Uh, if you, if in experiments, people are induced to give witness to something about which they have doubts, they start to believe their own words. And we've seen this in other experiments where in small steps, people are coaxed into doing an atrocity to deliver an electric shock to somebody. Yes. But as they do it, they come to believe in their own action. And so if, if you ask somebody to deliver and immobilize and electromatize an electric shock and they did it, I mean, they would be horrified. But if you can, in small steps, in a sense, corrupt them, you can change their minds and they begin to absorb what they're saying and acting. And that's what can lead uh, prisoners to become collaborators or uh, can turn uh, prospects into customers for, for that matter. <laughs> well, that's the more positive. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Conscience, conscience mutates. And I'm yeah. sure that happens with politicians as with the rest of us. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's the, the challenge of being reelected, whatever. Um, and that gets us to something, since we've talked about bias and politicians, the topic of faith. So how does faith um, um, enable us to understand ourselves, or does it? Um, um, how do you address that issue, uh, Dave? Uh, here's one thought that I'd have, John. I am a person of faith, and... Mm -hmm. If, if any of our listeners with us are people of faith, no matter what their faith tradition is, there's one thing that all people of faith believe if they're theists. And that actually there's two things. So the first is that there is a God. Mm -hmm. The second is that it's not me and it's not you. We are finite, fallible creatures. We have dignity, but we don't have deity. And thus 
we are uh, the surest belief I can I can have is that some of my beliefs contain error, and thus believing that is the ground of humility. To get back to that concept, John, yeah. so I can I can hold my own beliefs lightly. I can I I can act on the confidence that they're true, but I can hold them a certain amount lightly, and I can and and I can subject my beliefs to to the to the test of evidence, and so that's. Uh, that's the ground of science, uh, putting one's own ideas to the test. And mm -hmm. if they survive that test, so much the better for them. If they don't, so much the worse. Uh, right. There are other ways in which I'm intrigued by the connections between ideas about human nature from psychological science and from, let's say, ideas about human nature from biblical and theological scholarship. Mm -hmm. But I think fundamental to, to, uh, to my way of thinking is this is this theism that recognizes that human beings are not little gods mm -hmm. and the humility and the openness and the curiosity that follows from that, the eagerness to learn and to correct our own errors is foundational to all of science and, to, and, and I think in many ways to a flourishing life. With, I agree. Uh, and, you know, I, I come back to uh, our former head of the NIH, Francis Collins, um, a man of science, um, was also, is also a man of faith. And the two, um, he found uh, great solace in each, you know, and part of this humility that science doesn't have all the answers and neither does faith, you know, <laughs> and that's where we come in. So we have to maybe, is it, do we have to think for ourselves, Dave? So... Yeah, absolutely. And Francis Collins is a great hero to me. I mean, he's a model of exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And somebody who is who understands that science doesn't have all the answers, but also that that faith. And as we talked about earlier, our intuition needs to be restrained by reality. And that's part of what it means to worship God with our minds as well as our hearts. Yeah. That's great. Well, we are racing along in this show, and um, I ask uh, every guest on here a story about grace. Do you have one you would like to share with us, Dave? So, uh, well, I when I think of grace, uh, one of the thing my mind goes to is Paul Tillich's famous sermon on grace, which was entitled "You Are Accepted," which was playing off a passage from Romans, uh, where Paul writes about where sin abounds. Grace, that is God's acceptance and love, much more about. We mess up sometimes, and yet we can be in a profound way accepted. So I think of incidents in my life, like when I first drove the car, the day I turned 16 and got my license and came back and locked fenders with the other car in the garage. And I so worried my father would be upset with me, but he showed me grace, acceptance, kindness when I'd messed up. Believing in the power of grace, as I know you do, John, I then mm -hmm. want to be an instrument of grace or a model of grace to others in my life, to my children, my, my colleagues, those I work with, when they mess up. We all mess up sometimes. Yeah. And, and we, need to, we need to deal with that. Uh, we need to be held accountable. But at the same time, we can be loved and accepted. And so the people I work with do that for me. I mess up sometimes, but they help me. And I know at a deep level, I'm not threatened because they accept and affirm and love me. And right. I, want to do, I want to do that to the people. Well, I will say this book, How We Know Ourselves, is very much a book of grace because it's an exploration. Um, it doesn't have all the answers, but it asks a lot of questions and provides some great insights. So, Dave, how do you um, – you are – all over, but how can people uh, find you? How can they reach out to you, sir? So. Uh, they can reach out to me just by going to my website, davidmyers.org. Uh, and they have contact information and many of the things we've talked about are explored on that website. All you have to do is spell my last name right, David Myers, M-Y-E-R-S.org. Great. And we will put that in the notes with the correct spelling. Um, okay. And Dave Myers, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. And with that, we will sign off. Thank you, John. It's